of the seminar. So dear colleagues, dear friends, today is the second our Kharkiv chemical seminar uh, for all Ukraine. Before these two seminars, uh, we made this seminar only for our group in the State Scientific Institution, Institute for Single Crystals and for um, partially for National uh, in Kharkiv National University. And today is our guest from University of Strasbourg, Alexander Varnik. He is from uh, nationally from Ukraine. He was born in Ukraine, in one Ukrainian city, in Konotop, I think, yes? Yes, in Konotop. Uh, but <laughs> uh, due to um, request from Germany, our seminar will be today also in English. And I would like to present you our uh, lecturer, Alexander Warning. Is a full professor in theoretical chemistry, head of the laboratory of hemoinformatics, and the director of two Master of Science programs: Master of Science in Chemoinformatics and Master in Silico Drug Design at the University of Strasbourg. He is also head of hemoinformatics group at the Hokkaido University in Japan. He published uh, several books, two books and books in five book chapters and more than 250 research articles and delivered more than 100, 100 uh, lectures at national and international schools and meetings. He is an editor-in-chief of the journal Molecular Informatics. He is involved in the organization of series on international meetings uh, targeting academia and companies. His research focuses on hemoinformatics and molecular modeling. And I would like to say that he is also uh, uh, helped uh, to organize these Kharkiv chemical seminars because he invited several professors. One of these professors made his lecture uh, last time and maybe next uh, seminar also will be with a professor from University of Strasbourg. He's a Nobel Prize laureate, Jean Marilyn. And uh, thanks to Professor Warnick for his support and for his help. So you can start your, your lecture. Um, thank you very much, Valentin, for this kind introduction. So I will start with the geography issue. Uh, so I'm in Strasbourg. You know, Strasbourg is a far uh, east of France, you know, situated just in the border with Germany. So some local people consider Germany as a suburb of Strasbourg. But uh, in, from the European perspective, we are located just at the center of Europe and everything, uh, any country, including Ukraine, uh, are very close to, 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 to us. So we, in, in, at the University of Strasbourg, so we started to um, develop common informatics since uh, already 20 years. So we created a laboratory. Um, we created one of the first in the world master program in common informatics which nowadays has a, a double diploma agreements with uh, seven uni European universities. And uh, uh, very recently, uh, since this year, uh, all these double diploma um, universities, uh, they uh, were they gathered within one uh, a very prestigious European project, Erasmus Mundus. And I'm very happy to inform you that um, Tarashevchenko University of Kyiv is um, is a member of uh, uh, this consortium. So uh, our uh, collaborations uh, in uh, with Ukraine. So we have pretty good collaborations with Ukraine. As Valentin mentioned, uh, collaboration with <coughs> uh, Konotop, they are not really scientific. Uh, to me, uh, these are very personal collaborations. You know, uh, my classmates are still in Konotop. Uh, but uh, in Kyiv, uh, with Kyiv, in, uh, sorry, with Kyiv in, and Odessa, uh, we uh, have developed very good collaborations, uh, both in research and teaching. So uh, with Odessa, uh, I had uh, two uh, PhD students uh, um, with double supervision, uh, with Professor uh, Kuzmin and uh, with Taras Shevchenko, uh, namely with Institute of High Technologies. Uh, we have uh, very good uh, scientific collaborations, several papers, uh, and also this master program. And also we have very good contact with the Institute of Organic Chemistry and some companies, you know, I mean, ChemSpace, Bienta. Um, yeah. Now, uh, let we go to the subject of this uh, talk. 
I would like just to uh, you to to to, to um, come back to the time of uh, discussion between two Nobel laureates, uh, Alexander Todd, Robert Woodward, and Elias Corey, uh, who um, around a year, by the fact, but, uh, was actually written in the uh, book uh, by Judson. Um, they discussed what is really chemical synthesis. Is it some sort of art or real science? So, you know, uh, and this opinion were pretty, uh, you know, different. Todd and Woodward considered chemical synthesis as an art, uh, which actually calls for imagination and creativity beyond the uh, capacity of computer. Whereas Corey was much more optimistic and he really believed that one day computer can, uh, uh, computer uh, will be capable to design chemical synthesis uh, even better than a chemist can do this. You know, um, <clears throat> uh, till let's say uh, 2018, it, uh, you know, computer uh, tools were very little used in uh, synthesis in, 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 in practice. But since, um, you know, explosional development uh, of deep learning and what do people call artificial intelligence me methods, you know, since that time, the situation drastically changed and it seems that, uh, uh, you know, the point of view of Corey started to be uh, more and more valuable. So we'll discuss this uh, in my talk and then we'll come back to this point just in, in the very end. Okay, so now in sense of terminology, uh, artificial intelligence is used to describe machines that mimic cognitive functions that humans associate with the human minds, such as learning and problem solving. So, um, in fact, uh, you know, the, uh, this something which act, which may act like humans, human beings. Okay, uh, nowadays uh, we all uh, uh, widely use uh, different applications of uh, artificial intelligence. You know, we have our uh, mobile phones, <coughs> we do uh, internet shopping, and uh, very clever uh, software actually suggests us something. The uh, software in internet shopping already learns a little bit what we want to buy and suggest us something. Uh, there are self-driving cars, um, recognition of objects in images, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and also there exist uh, several very interesting applications of artificial intelligence chemistry, and this. Um, field emerges in chemistry because of many different aspects. First of all, because of big data exposure. Uh, actually, all uh, fields of uh, science and industry started to generate a lot of uh, data. You know, in chemistry in particular, it, it is related to development of new uh, uh, methods of synthesis like uh, combinatorial synthesis, parallel synthesis, etc. You know, um, so uh, the number of uh, uh, data uh, in the chemical abstract service database, uh, which is known on the um, interface of say finder scholar, actually this number of records uh, exponentially increases. Then the second uh, aspect is uh, development of uh, uh, automatized methods of synthesis of robots. So I will speak about this in my presentation. So then in sense of um, uh, theoretical uh, methods, uh, new efficient methods of machine learning has been developed. In particular, these are different kinds of uh, deep le learning network, networks which mimics uh, uh, functioning of our brain. And then, uh, thanks to uh, big companies like Facebook or Google, you know, many uh, computer codes used for uh, language translations or, um, um, you know, uh, object recognitions, they have become freely available for the users. Uh, 
And all this created the good conditions to, for, for emergency of AI application in chemistry. So um, <clears throat> we will consider two uh, main options of uh, um, uh, usage of uh, artificial intelligence in chemistry. So um, the most obvious is to use um, AI tools as some sort of collaborator, which can be used if a real chemist, human chemist, does need it. You know, it's some sort of collaborator, you know, assistance, bringing uh, solutions if human chemist does uh, ask. But much more interesting uh, application is when uh, artificial intelligence uh, becomes a decision maker, uh, which con uh, control fully automatized process of the design and synthesis of new molecule. So actually, both uh, uh, applications we will consider in this uh, talk, uh, and um, both they do exist. Okay, so what is the plan? First of all, I'm very sorry, so I, I'm, I, I don't know if you are very familiar with chem informatics. So um, if yes, I can skip some slides. Otherwise, um, I, would, I would like just to give you some very, very basic information about this field. Then we will consider AI as a consultant, then as a decision maker. And finally, we'll consider the question of AI creativity. If artificial intelligence can be as creative as human can. Okay. <clears throat> Let's start with chem informatics. You know, so chem informatics uh, is a field uh, uh, corresponding to application of uh, AI uh, methods in chemistry, and it uh, uh, actually uh, this is the for the moment uh, data science field. So it uh, builds its models uh, on available experimental data, which are chemical structures biological activities, physical chemical activities, for synthetic chemistry reaction yield, et cetera, et cetera. These are experimental data, which are measured uh, by experimental chemists. Um, then uh, this data must be transformed in the form uh, understandable for computer. And for all, well, so for example, chemical structure can be represented by text strings, uh, bit chain, a molecular graph, matrix, vector shape, some sort of interaction patterns, uh, and uh, simply 3D coordinates of all, you know. And then finally, uh, computer um, analyzes this, and with the help of machine learning algorithm, it creates um, some sort of equation, uh, which is could be represented uh, or not represented uh, in its analytical way, in analytical form, you know. Uh, on the left side, we have a, a property or biological activity. And on the right side, we have a function, which is usually nonlinear function from the structure. Um, so this is uh, the, uh, the basic, uh, let's say, uh, um, view on chem informatics as a data science. And then more, in more details, when we uh, discuss this uh, equation, uh, property or activity as a function of structure, so structure must be um, I would say in 90 percent, 95 percent, it is uh, represented by ensemble of parameters derived from molecular structures, and these para parameters are called molecular descriptors. And uh, these molecular, these, these descriptors, they describe uh, different property properties of chemical structures like size, shape, volume. Atomic charges, uh, particular substructural fragments, etc., uh, etc. Et Partition coefficient, for example, log, log p, and uh, these numbers uh, are uh, arguments of uh, the equation, which is built with the help of machine learning methods. Some of them, like support vector machine, neural networks, random forest, etc., they are um, the list uh, is given uh, on the left. Uh, side of this uh, <coughs> of this one. Okay, 
And then just a few words concerning descriptors. You know, uh, there exist more than 500 uh, different types of descriptors, and this number uh, continues to, to, to raise. Uh, and so in such a way, you know, so you associate uh, molecular graph, molecular structure, which is on the left, with descriptor vector, ensemble of uh, this number of descriptors, which form a vector, which form some sort of uh, fingerprint, uh, which can be used for to build uh, machine learning models or to visualize the uh, molecules in such called chemical space. So, you know, this is a bit strange when we associate molecular graph, you know, chemical structure, which, uh, which all chemists understand uh, well, with a uh, very, um, uh, with, with a vector of numbers. But in any case, when we have real fingerprint, uh, it, it is somehow can be associated with a face. Uh, but they they don't these two objects don't resemble each other. But anyway, using a fingerprint, uh, uh, one can uh, uniquely identify, uh, non ambitiously identify the face. You know, so this is a bit relations. So then, as soon as this model uh, I, uh, is built, uh, you know, this could be a machine learning model. It could be similarity searching. We'll speak about. Or you know some docker pharmacophore, all these machine learning models uh, can be applied to a chemical database. It could be database of real compounds or um, virtual compounds, like enamine does. Uh, and then this results in selection of some useful molecules and discarding useless molecules. This procedure is. Uh, known under the name of virtual screening. And it is very, very, very widely used uh, everywhere to um, select uh, theoretically new structures uh, out of uh, billions uh, of uh, virtual or real structures. OK. Now uh, I would like just to say just very few words about chemical similarity. You know, let's consider uh, two structures represented on the slide, A and B. Uh, if these structures are, are similar, you can say yes, because there are many uh, uh, common motif, structural motifs. But uh, if you can you measure quantitatively this chemical similarity? Yes, this can be done using um, uh, very specific metrics. So there are some, um, many of them. The most widely used uh, is called Tanimoto coefficient. And simply Tanimoto coefficient, uh, measures uh, the number of uh, types of fragments in molecule A, in molecule B, and number of uh, common fragments. And then there is very uh, simple uh, uh, formula uh, to calculation. So this similarity uh, varies in the range from zero, completely different structures, to one identical structures. So, and in such a way, uh, you know, Chemical informaticians very, very uh, well, chemists, anyway, this is very, very well used uh, approach. Uh, can um, launch a search, similarity searching in uh, the database, and uh, for the reference compound, find it's uh, more or less similar analogs. The numbers here are uh, corresponds to this Tenimoto coefficient, and as you may see, um, that uh, larger numbers, which, which are close to one, corresponds to, to the structures which are more similar to the query, to the reference compounds, than uh, the compounds with small Tanimoto uh, coefficient, which are on the right. OK. Uh, so far, I've finished. Oh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. Yeah, OK. <coughs> um, this talk is dedicated uh, uh, in part to, to synthetic chemists, you know. So all these chemoinformatics tools, most of them are developed for individual molecules. What about chemical reactions? Oh, this is by the fact, this is a problem of uh, the complexity of this object. Indeed, a chemical reaction, you know, uh, any chemical reactions contains uh, several species of two types, reactants and products. And the yield depends on experimental conditions. So um, how one can reduce this complexity? Uh, what we have suggested, you know, so we, we followed some 
very, very old publications. And we uh, suggested to uh, represent a chemical reaction by uh, some sort of pseudo molecule, which we uh, call condensed graph of reaction. And this condensed graph uh, of reaction results from superpositions of uh, related atoms of products and reactants. And then this pseudo molecule uh, is represented by both conventional chemical bonds, single double aromatics, and such called dynamical bonds corresponding to chemical transformations, like green is created single bond and uh, uh, the um, red is a uh, uh, broken single bond. So we can consider single bond to double, double to single, et cetera, et cetera. So we have many types of uh, dynamical bond. And the advantage of this is that when we consider chemical reaction as a pseudo molecule, we can calculate for this pseudo molecule molecular descriptors and to apply uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence methods uh, to treat this object. Okay, that's all with this concerning the uh, um, chemical informatics background. We have some questions, no? Is it okay? I can, can continue my talk? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yes. Yes, good. So, now, what do chemists expect from artificial intelligence tool? So actually, there are only two, but important questions. So <laughs> what chemical structure uh, possess? So the, the goal is of any chemist to, to identify chemical structure possessing desirable activity or activity profile or property profile. And as, as soon as this molecule is Find, uh, found by theoretical methods. So another question is how this molecule can be synthesized. You know, um, you know what is drug molecule? Uh, discovery of uh, from the laboratory to, to, to um, the pharmacy of one uh, um, drug costs roughly three billion euro. You know, this is one organic molecule, one organic structure. If one can guess just this structure in advance, uh, you know, uh, at least 1 billion uh, euro could be, let's say, saved. <coughs> so now, how artificial intelligence um, answers this question? You know, uh, first question, I uh, already, um, I've given an, an answers. One of the answer is to use visual screening procedure. Another, another uh, answer is to use um, very special neural networks uh, able to generate automat automatically new structures. I will speak about this about uh, in the end of this uh, talk. Now I would like to focus uh, on the second question. So how a given molecule can be synthesized? So we have a target molecule. Uh, how to make it? So what what we what do we want? Um, we want to establish a synthesis planning which relates a target molecule with a starting material. So we have, a, for example, in an amine catalog, uh, uh, a collection of building blocks, and we would like uh, to relate somehow target molecule with a starting material. What what which means that we we need to. Um, uh, we, we need to ask an uh, AI tool to suggest us this um, uh, reaction path, you know, uh, which involves several steps. For example, here are these steps, but this is not sufficient. Uh, yeah, and this actually could be done technically in a backward manner, which is called retrosynthesis, or from starting to target material, forward, in for, forward manner. But then, as soon as this synthetic plan is established, for each particular step, we need to know which are optimal reaction conditions leading to a reasonable yield. And if this reaction is, uh, let's say, if its kinetic uh, parameters are good enough, you know, because we don't want to, to, to wait for uh, weeks, you know, until the reactions 
<coughs> is possible. So um, finally, so we need a reaction plan, synthesis plan, and for each step we need uh, to precise optimal uh, reaction conditions. Okay, this is a, some sort of, uh, let's say, uh, um, dream of synthetic chemists. And by the fact, uh, modern artificial intelligence methods are not too far to, uh, let's say, uh, discover all this. Okay, now you have uh, the list of uh, AI tools which uh, already exist uh, in practice and which could be used in, let's say, uh, different scales uh, in the practice of, uh, of synthetic chemists. So these are forward and retro synthesis, most retro synthesis, assessment of uh, optimal reaction conditions, prediction of major product, and prediction of reaction yield, kinetic and thermodynamic parameters. Okay. So um, let's start with uh, now to describe all, all these tools from the perspective when we use an uh, AI tool as a consultant. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, you know, a uh, few words about uh, retrosynthesis. Uh, the idea belongs to Elias Corey, Nobel uh, laureate, um, developed a, a very famous Alhasa uh, program. And the idea is uh, relatively simple. We have a target molecule, we uh, can, cut it into precursors, ensemble of precursors. Um, and then uh, we can cut it maybe by di different way. Or again, we have some sort of uh, different uh, um, ensemble of precursors, uh, you know, maybe uh, third way, you know. So in such a way, we uh, have very different, uh, we have different uh, uh, reaction scenario. So, for example, here Suzuki reaction, uh, Sugusawa reaction, or sectization reaction. Okay. So, um, and then each precursor we can uh, again fragment until uh, we come to uh, the list of commercially available building blocks. So, uh, all these rules according to which we can fragment this molecule or precursors are called synthetic rules. And Corey actually uh, prepared uh, the list of these rules. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, some 59, uh, some 50 rules, um, just because of, you know, his chemical knowledge. So um, the, the, the problem here is that, uh, you know, finally, if the number of steps is uh, big enough, it may bring the, the number of possible uh, synthetic roots may uh, be explosively high. So uh, it this consideration of all possible uh, variants may lead to uh, some sort of combinatorial explosion. So we need to identify somehow the most optimal routes. Okay, so then concerning retrosynthetic rules, they could be derived by humans like Corey did uh, or learned automatically by the fact by AI tool from experimental data or you not only learned directly, like, you know, what, what, what is uh, the rule? Uh, amine plus acid leads to amine, amide. You know, this is one rule, for example. It could be learned automatically, but also uh, there exists some, no, not, not, not too many, it's more in the, uh, at the level of <coughs> first attempts <coughs> that uh, these rules could be learned, uh, taken into account uh, not only uh, existing data, it means the reaction equations, but also some knowledge on reaction mechanism. So, okay. And uh, um, existing uh, retrosynthetic tools, they, uh, there are different, some which are based on human derived uh, rules, there are some uh, based on the learned uh, by AI from the data. Okay, this slide, I would like actually to, to, to um, comment the slide. This slide actually show the principle of such called Monte Carlo research approach, uh, which war was first developed for the uh, game theory, uh, namely for the um, Go game, 
And just because of this AlphaGo uh, algorithm, uh, computer first actually uh, won uh, the game from human, you know, not only in chess, but also in Go because of this AlphaGo algorithm, uh, uh, which is called uh, Monte Carlo Tree Search. So uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, Monte, Carlo, Monte Carlo Tree Search algorithm, with some modifications, are implemented in, in Reaccess database, in SafeFinder database. Uh, which are commercial products, well known to chemists, and also uh, in uh, the, the, uh, there exists development from AstraZeneca, uh, which is called uh, uh, Azin Finder, um, and uh, um, there are many startups which uh, offer their own implementations. So we also have uh, our uh, implementation of this. Um, and so, so nowadays it has become, let's say, uh, since a publication of uh, this paper in Nature by Segler, Segler and Waller, uh, uh, and opening the code, it has become, uh, let's say, not a, 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 some sort of exotic, but uh, a real tool which is able to, 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 to um, generate uh, possible synthetic uh, uh, Roots. Okay, so this is actually our uh, first trial for uh, the drug um, molecule, apatinib. So we uh, discovered several um, several uh, synthetic roots, and then surprisingly, synthetic root two was found later on in uh, the database of American patents, patents which is called uh, USPTO database. So um, another, um, there are many, many um, examples published in the literature. Um, this is uh, actually another program, which is called Cynthia. Um, the previous name uh, was Schematica, developed, developed by um, Polish chemist uh, Bartosz uh, Lichubowski. He is now in uh, um, South Korea. And, uh, this actual example shows the same reaction, uh, which actually uh, experimentally was found, was, you know, first published synthesis in five steps. The uh, program um, Cynthia uh, found a more, uh, let's say, economical uh, pathway in three steps, and these three steps was uh, were then realized uh, by, you know, uh, carried out experimentally. And uh, so there is some publication, a publication in 2018. So Cynthia is a commercial product. So now I would like just to, to show you um, another um, uh, tool, which is called, uh, was, initially it was called Cynthia, uh, but then Cynthia people was very, uh, were not happy, and they actually asked us to change the name, and now it's, the tool is called Synton. Uh, so Synton is a, a tool uh, built Look at the time just to analyze the uh, building block library <coughs> existing in the world. And uh, we used uh, 38 uh, retrosynthetic rules for fragmentation. So, this work, um, I'm very happy to cite this work because uh, this project, project has been realized in collaboration with uh, Ukrainian scientists. Maybe you know the name of Dmitry Volochnuk, Sergei Rebuchin. Konstantin Gavrilenko, uh, Alexander Ksuta, Alexander Ksuta, my former student from Strasbourg, you know, and in collaboration with uh, our group. And uh, number one in this uh, project was Yuliana Zabolotna. Um, she was a double diploma student between Kiev and Strasbourg. Um, and she defended her thesis in Strasbourg. And nowadays, uh, she is a postdoc in my laboratory. So, um, okay, what actually Sinti was done? Sinti, uh, the, the first idea of Sinti, well, this is turned a little bit toward uh, uh, chemical synthesis and uh, building block uh, uh, an analysis. So uh, first, you know, uh, well-known observation when the same building block uh, can be can behave differently in different, uh, with different reagents. You know, uh, well, this aldehyde, um, 
gives uh, different projects and reacts according to different mechanisms in these three reactions, you know. Um, uh, and we, we, can, we can suggest that it can produce three, some sort of intermediates, which we call synton. Synton means a building block uh, minus living group. Uh, and then, so we can assign reaction center. So first uh, is uh, uh, the positive charge is electrophil, uh, positive charge plus one on the carbon. Uh, second is positive charge uh, plus two on the carbon, or this uh, is uh, um, some sort of uh, alcohol with uh, CH plus. Okay, so and th th that's for, uh, therefore actually we have uh, this different, uh, we encode this by different uh, uh, formulas, formula in which we put a special label corresponding to type of reaction. 10, 30, and 10, these are types of reaction. Okay, so um, please notice that one building block may produce several different symptoms, whereas one symptom can correspond to different building blocks. So all these building blocks on the right, actually, uh, are equivalent in sense of their reactivity. Uh, they produce the same symptom. Okay, so uh, what was idea to use symptom? I would like just to come back to retrosynthesis. Uh, retrosyn actually, retrosynthesis was not uh, the main goal of uh, this um, development. So we simply we, we wanted to analyze uh, existing building blocks and um, then to use maybe symptom uh, uh, for enumeration of large libraries. But anyway, there is a side application for the uh, synthetic plant. So the idea is to uh, take compound of interest uh, the, just on the bottom of the slide and to use um, retrosynthetic rules, um, one of uh, out of 30, 38 considered to split the molecules of symptom and then to compare the uh, resulting symptoms with the database of available symptoms produced from the library of available building blocks. And then if we find a uh, different uh, synthetic paths, so there exists a uh, prioritization uh, uh, score, which helps us to um, uh, rank the synthetic paths according to the score. So just to, to, to show you an example, so we have uh, this drug molecule, um, Gino, uh, Gino B made this it seems uh, it used uh, as a therapy against Alzheimer um, and uh, Alzheimer or epilepsy frankly don't remember and then so we can actually uh, cut uh, the same bond which is shown on on the on the slide so uh, we, we can cut into fragments but using different uh, chemical transformations as the uh, chain even slam coupling or as an alkylation, okay? And uh, this actually different mechanism explain uh, why we put different labels on uh, the metal group. Okay, then uh, what we can do, uh, yeah, by the fact these uh, symptoms, uh, they correspond to potential building blocks shown, shown on the um, uh, right side of the slide. So the building blocks are already different. And then we can continue to fragment uh, the largest uh, uh, synton. And then finally, we can get uh, different smaller synton, which could be associated with the building blocks. And then we can look uh, if these building blocks, they are present in the library of building blocks and select those which contribute, let's say, more, which actually is synthetic, synthetic pass, which uh, uh, has more syntons um, uh, most more symptoms uh, uh, available in the database. So, um, so in such a way, we, we 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 have this tool which is very fast, which is uh, much faster than uh, as you find the, uh, for example, uh, AI tool, and uh, um, it gives uh, very uh, realistic results. So, as you may see for this particular reaction. Uh, we found this in the uh, in the literature in patterns. Okay, so the same uh, synthetic path 
was uh, found uh, practically the same by as a finder, finder and all this actually gives some realistic uh, results because it corresponds to, experiment, to the experiment so in such a way uh, just to conclude uh, the tools for retro synthesis represent a real um, um, these are real tools you can use this either using the axis or say finder or uh, to implement IZ Finder. So this all these implementations uh, this behave a bit differently. Um, to me, I would prefer uh, IZ Finder or our own tools, but anyway, this is a question of taste. Okay, yeah, all this, you know, all these uh, uh, synthetic paths, they, they contain uh, very similar elements. Okay, so um, now uh, second question, if let's say computer is able to uh, predict the product distribution we have reactions a reaction a plus b plus c whatever you know in particular conditions for the product distribution so you know um uh, correct uh, uh, colleague published a paper uh in which actually he uh, reported results of survey you know uh, he selected several reactions so some 100 reactions and ask uh, people, chemists, uh, you know, all chemists, it uh, corresponds to human average, uh, black curve. Among those who sele uh, he selected a uh, subgroup of the best human you know, chemists, let's say professors. Okay, this is the um, blue line. Uh, and it, he, he compared this with the prediction by the model, which is red line. So actually, his, uh, among the reactions uh, uh, for which he suggested to, uh, he asked to uh, predict the product distribution, there were uh, very popular reactions. You know, the number on, on the horizontal axis corresponds to reaction popularity. In, uh, you know, the number of reactions in the database. More reaction is pre present in the database, more it is popular and easier uh, to find a, a question, you know, an answer, you know, what is the product. So um, higher the curve is, the better predictions are. And as you may see, a uh, red line and blue line, they uh, more or less superpose and they are higher than, um, um, their positions higher than black line. So which means that uh, AI performs similarly to human experts in synthetic chemistry. Yes, um, which is already a good sign. You know, it means that we already at the level of uh, uh, real exploitation of uh, uh, AI tools. They gives, they provide us with realistic predictions. Okay, so uh, with respect to conditions, so I'm already uh, a bit out of time. So I'm still, uh, you know, I have some, um, just I will, I, will, I will show you, I have some slides related to protection group reactivity. So when, when we predicted, um, <coughs> when we competed with this book <coughs> of Theodora Green and we uh, uh, demonstrated that uh, computers actually uh, performs much uh, better than uh, human chemists in sense of predicting um, experimental conditions for uh, selective deprotection of um, uh, chemical compounds. So I would like just to, to show you that it, it, this part, it, it does exist, okay? Another part which is related to um, uh, prediction of uh, experimental uh, conditions leading to optimal yield, just a few words, this is very important, you know. This is a, one, one of the most difficult point of uh, in, in uh, um, a reaction chemoinformatic to predict reaction conditions. Why? Because the same reaction can proceed at different conditions first. And the second is that no negative examples are available. What does it mean? People never publish uh, experimental conditions which don't lead to a uh, reasonable yield. People uh, actually used to publish something which they which which works, you know. But for machine learning, negatives exam negative examples are as uh, important as positive examples. So, uh, you know, this actually makes life uh, very difficult. Uh, what we can, what, what we suggested, we suggested actually not to predict exactly 
one experimental condition. Uh, just to tell you what, what he said, suggested, this is suggested to produce a ranked list. So ranked list of more than 2000 uh, conditions, and this list is ranked according to the probability that reaction will carry out uh, will be carried out well under these conditions. So it means that in this particular list, you know, medium temperature, low pressure, rene nickel catalyst and uh, acid uh, reagent actually is the best uh, suggestion. So um, in such a way, so we applied this for uh, 90,000 hydrogenation reaction from reaxis and we trained a uh, model, the model, and then we, uh, let's say, uh, estimated this model just for, for the literature the data, just to tell you that what, what means K, uh, K means the number of reaction uh, of, of, of the, let's say, uh, first uh, K uh, lines in the list. So 10 means that we take first 10 in this ranked list, and for, for the given reaction, we expect that at least one of these conditions will correspond to, to the experiment. And this corresponds to the experiment for k equal to 10. Uh, this corresponds with a probability of 82%. So it means that we suggest several possible conditions, and then experimentalists may try, you know, uh, several of them, and with probability 82%, uh, one of these 10 uh, will be successful. Okay, so we uh, collaborated with chemists and uh, uh, they performed several uh, hydrogenation uh, reactions. And uh, uh, in most of cases, we were pretty successful as shown on this slide. So, you know, this is a, the same um, substrate, uh, which actually uh, underwent uh, by different uh, transformations as a function of uh, reaction conditions. And what we, it was, practically exactly the same what we have predicted. Okay, Trebian. Uh, now, um, very quickly, uh, uh, concerning um, prediction of kinetic. This difficult question, why? Because the database, uh, Reaxis or say Finder, they practically don't uh, contain the information about uh, reaction rates. So what we did, we used a uh, very old handbook on reaction rates uh, published by uh, in Estonia and Soviet Union, let's say in uh, 70s, you know, it's fantastic by the fact collection of, uh, of data. Uh, it was a, a pre-database time and Victor Palm was a pioneer of the um, chemical database of chemical handbooks uh, uh, development. Or, you know, so we use this and or existing PhD and cohabilitation thesis. And uh, in such a way, we collected the data for uh, to build uh, models predicting reaction rate for, um, let's say, some classical uh, reaction types like SN2, um, uh, cyclic uh, uh, addition, um, um, totemerization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we published many papers on this, uh, and uh, actually these um, results are available. So for those who are interested, so we can, um, uh, I can actually give you some more information. So just, I would like just to, to, to go uh, very quickly to more, um, to more uh, 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 exciting issues uh, if AI, is able to fully control the workflow of the design and synthesis of new model. The, question, the answer is positive, yes. So by the fact in 2000, I would like to just to, to point out, to, 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 to notice a publication of uh, in 2014 in Nature, very futuristic uh, article uh, discussing future robot chemist, which a machine which could make a billion uh, uh, compounds on demand. You know, you call and, you know. and exactly this year, a good friend of mine, Wilbert Schneider from ETH in Zurich, he published uh, in Angevant a very interesting paper in which 
he reported structures and biological activities of uh, several molecules which were designed and synthesized without any human uh, intervention. So they actually his uh, experimental platform, uh, which is the size of the coin, my, uh, uh, microfluidic, uh, contains chemical platform, uh, biological assays platform, was, and these two platforms were related to uh, the computer. And you know, the uh, chemoinformatics model uh, actually suggested the most um, uh, feasible uh, reagents uh, for click reaction, reactions, uh, reaction was very simple and uh, uh, fast, click, uh, click reaction. So the idea was just to select uh, uh, reasonable um, reagents A and B. And then in uh, two steps, actually, uh, the synthesis was performed. Well, in one step, the synthesis was, was performed. And then uh, biological assays results went to, to the computer. Computer actually updated uh, <coughs> structure activity model. And then uh, as the next iteration, it suggested new combination of A and B. And finally, actually it resulted to, to uh, this new active biological active molecules uh, in the processes, which was completely computer guided without any human intervention. This is fantastic, you know, this, this is an example when artificial intelligence fully replaced human chemistry. You know, uh, then, you know, there are many, many different, uh, actually, papers so far published about success of robots, you know, uh, which can um, um, work uh, uh, the, the days and the nights, you know, and th this exact is example of, uh, you know, uh, machine uh, learning, uh, guided uh, optimization of reaction conditions leading to um, the composition of water uh, on hydrogen and uh, oxygen and then finally you know within uh, um, several days you know fully automatized work um, they uh, the computer suggested optimal uh, set of reaction conditions leading to very high yield okay and but nowadays seriously speaking big uh, uh, Pharma industry like AstraZeneca, Roche, Novartis, Janssen, and some other companies, they actually uh, they uh, invest a lot in creation of um, AI-driven uh, robots. You know, able to suggest molecules and suggest synthetic plan and realize this synthetic plan in the scale up to ten gram grade. You know, this is absolutely fantastic uh, achievement. And actually this year uh, is just started. Okay, so um, um, another pro problem, you know, for project related to, to uh, IBM robot. IBM actually <laughs> suggested, you know, the service, special service, chemists can actually uh, call and uh, demand synthesis of molecule. You know, uh, this is a competitor of uh, enamine, I believe. Uh, Okay, so Valentin, uh, tell me if I still have a few minutes just to speak about uh, AI creativity. Yes, I, I think you have it. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, I speak a bit too much. Right now. Okay, anyway, um, look, this um, piece of uh, the fine art uh, has been sold on Christie's in uh, 2018 for mm -hmm. almost half of a billion of dollars. And this uh, painting was created by computer. You know, this is a, a signature is a formula of such called generated adversarial network, you know. <coughs> and uh, um, Edward Bellamy, Bellamy, it's Bel Ami in French language, uh, is a French translation of uh, the uh, good fellow. Good fellow is inventor of this mathematical approach, mathematical algorithm. Okay, so how actually um, uh, artificial intelligence was able to create this? You know, first uh, it loaned uh, existing painting, uh, more than 15,000 painting, uh, and then collected information uh, was sufficient to create new um, new paintings, okay? And finally, uh, you know, people, uh, three, three persons actually, uh, 
which participate in the project actually got uh, this nice amount of money. Good. And the idea actually for uh, uh, artificial for, for chemistry is uh, the same, you know, similar. So, okay. um, artificial intelligence learns um, uh, co content of chemical database for molecules of reaction. And then actually, uh, this information uh, could be sufficient to generate new molecules or new chemical transformation. So, you know, many people now uh, do this. So, we also. And uh, in most of cases, people use a tool which is called uh, autoencoder. Autoencoder is a tool which um, reproduces the same object. And uh, uh, in particular in chemistry, people use such called uh, uh, text based or sequence to sequence um, autoencoder, in which uh, the computer tries to reproduce the same uh, text string. So as soon as chemical structure could be encoded in such a test, test, text string, you know, this which is called smiles. So this is a very, very classical encoding uh, by text, chemical structures. And then what happens uh, just in the way between uh, two modules, one encoder and another decoder, this text is transformed into vector of real numbers. And then what people do as soon as this um, uh, tool is uh, trained, then they uh, take a particular structure, a particular seed, seed corresponding, takes a corresponding vector, and they modify a little bit this vector, and they produce a new text string uh, corresponding to new chemical structures. So this is a bit um, um, the idea. Then uh, uh, now this slide sh uh, uh, shows, uh, this slide compares existing structure used to train the model and uh, structures, the novel structures generated by computers. You know, on one hand, you see that these structures uh, generated and existing structures, they look similar. But from the formal point of view, they have different scaffolds and uh, just uh, you know on one hand they're similar on the other hand they are enriched uh, uh, with new scaffolds and then we uh, we didn't uh, perform experiments but uh, uh, we used uh, docking approach uh, just to demonstrate that this molecules can be biologically active okay and then finally with respect to chemical reactions if artificial intelligence and intelligence can produce new chemical reactions. You know, we took, for example, Suzuki reaction. Suzuki got his Nobel Prize for this uh, coupling reaction. And uh, our idea was, you know, so you know, if let's say uh, discovery of new type of chemical reactions leads to Nobel Prize, maybe uh, when we apply um, uh, artificial intelligence, it brings us a Nobel Prize. Oh. Why not? So we tried the Suzuki reactions. We, we trained uh, first the tool on uh, the uh, database of American patents, more than 205 uh, million. And then we, I, I would like to bother you with the many, many different you know, information technologies uh, which we used. Uh, so we, we published this in scientific reports uh, last year. So but anyway, so we, uh, the, the um, computer, uh, discovered a new, with respect to the training set, Suzuki-like reactions. And then afterwards, we found uh, five of them, five, five types in the literature. So it means that uh, the, but these five were not used for the model training. It means that um, the, uh, uh, new reactions invented by computers were pretty realistic. Which are these reactions? You know, so well, in sense of Suzuki reactions. So they correspond either to exotic coupling. In his, in this case, this is a uh, bromination reaction. So it, which proceed uh, like Suzuki, you know, this is a C brom coupling, or to exotic living group. In this case, this is a, a, a floor is a living group is very very uh, uh, really observed. Just to summarize, you know. So uh, is AI really creative? Not really. It's still in, 
in, the, in, in terms of creativity, it is like a child, this uh, state uh, of infancy. So um, why? To my opinion, this you know, molecular design should not only be data driven, but also mechanistically grounded. It means that AI needs to learn fundamentals of chemistry, physics, biology, material science, etc. So no, and but uh, I'm pretty optimistic in this uh, context. So I would like just to uh, to, to end uh, my talk with this. Uh, uh, some sort of joke, what is the future of AI in chemistry? You know, this is a job in the advertisement in the internet. Uh, synthetic chemists uh, are, you know, I want it, but humans need not apply. Certainly for the moment, this is a joke, but who knows? According to some estimations in uh, 2015, um, artificial intelligence will be able to perform any intellectual tasks a human can Perform. So then I would like just to <coughs> ask your attention on the books uh, in, uh, uh, for those who want to, to learn chemoinformatics. You know, we have a textbook uh, produced in Russian language, uh, but nowadays all my, um, you know, my uh, co authors, Igor Baskin, is in Technion, Timur Majido is in Reaxis. So, and we, we are preparing uh, the English edition of uh, this textbook. And then uh, already uh, published in uh, Wally tutorials in common informatics. So, and then I would like just to thank uh, uh, people from my teams uh, in Strasbourg and Hokkaido for their uh, contributions. And then I would like to thank all of you <coughs> for your kind, for your patience and kind attention. And uh, I would like to say <coughs> a word of support of your fighting. Um, Slava Ukrainsim and Slava Ukraini. Uh, thank, thank you very much for a very, very interesting lecture. Uh, not optimistic the end of your lecture. Maybe in the future we will find, we will search for a new profession. Okay. Uh, chemists, do you have a questions? You can raise your hand or write your questions in the chat, please. <coughs> huh? Elias? Um, uh, um, hello. Uh, Professor, can you tell us about how do you deal with their overfitting regarding classification models did you use? Oof, uh, you know, classical uh, overfit, you know, the, the, the the most uh, classical way is uh, cross-validation, you know, so we use systematic cross-validation. And then uh, we also use um, a wise crowning approach uh, just to, to see if we have chance, some sort of chance correlation. So generally, uh, um, several times repeated cross-validation is a good way to show uh, that, uh, to see if you have an overfit or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, our Germany <laughs> group. Welcome. Uh, I wanted to ask a question when artificial intelligence will give Nobel Prize, price, not only receive one, but uh, my question is different one. Uh, what about multi component reaction? Is it possible to predict products from? Let's say three sets, almost sets of compounds, and product distribution of them, and then, uh, how does it apply to your prediction scheme? Actually, the, uh, in principle, retrosynthesis uh, predicts the entire uh, synthetic path. Okay, but then um, uh, this uh, another model uh, for each step is used just to confirm the first model. You know, so it means that uh, we take uh, retrosynthetic retrosynthesis, uh, forward synthesis suggests us um, several a, a pathway from a react from building blocks to um, target compounds or vice versa, but then uh, and, and it suggests us 
several steps, multi-steps uh, a process. But then for each step, we need some sort of confirmation. Uh, so it means that some sort of additional model, which uh, really uh, uh, confirms that uh, from this reactant, we can uh, obtain uh, a given product. And even then, uh, so under which suggests the optimal conditions, etc. So, so that means that I, I have no, there is no problem uh, in principle with multi-stage reactions. Uh, and the, the, the products can be really um, depend on the structure of uh, I mean of the functionals in the total material. It also has to take into account which uh, function tolerate other ones. Not have like fully condensed materials and so on. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question correctly. So, uh, do you mean that uh, it, uh, the you, you have uh, in the building block actually uh, uh, corresponds to the combination of the function, chemical function, and protect protecting group? Uh, in multi component section, uh, the building blocks is, is usually multi functional. The, the, the yeah, the, the, the idea is that, you know, um, this is the most delicate uh, uh, step because, uh, you know, uh, in, in for the multifunction uh, uh, substrates, um, we need actually to predict uh, at the same time um, reaction conditions, the catalyst solvent, etc., leading to selective transformation. And this is still uh, the bottleneck of uh, the modern artificial intelligence. You know, the most difficult, uh, you know, um, um, the most difficult issue to, to be predicted uh, are uh, reaction conditions leading to uh, selective transformations. Uh, it's just a matter of learning as So in multi-component just we can continue our work without artificial intelligence. <laughs> in robotic okay because it was also my question yeah other questions please dear colleagues you can write if you want or you can ask in in russian also in ukrainian it's no problem yeah uh Elias? Uh -huh. one more question um so it's um uh all these so-called uh, classification models can be um assumed as empirical somehow as as to me so it means that uh, uh, we use certain um chemical reaction conditions and to um, and assume that these conditions are uh, either continuous, I mean that we can raise temperature just continuously, or uh, some predict uh, predictors uh, are step by step. So I mean that we have some building blocks and we can't uh, add uh, one and a half, we can add one, two, three. So I mean, uh, how do we um, um, how do we interpret such different uh, descriptors, continuous and discrete, in these models. Mm. Well, first of all, actually, you 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 speak all this about classification model, but actually, what means classification model? That this model which predicts the label, uh, let's say active, inactive. Yes. Uh, so we we build uh, any more, you know, we build also such called regression models, pre which predict uh, the the yield or. Um, uh, reaction uh, rate constant, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, your question is more related to um, uh, generation of uh, uh, structures uh, by, uh, you know, uh, using this uh, the very last uh, uh, part of my lecture, uh, using this uh, autoencoder tool. So indeed, you know, uh, the molecule may, cannot contain uh, 1.5 metal group. Yeah, but <laughs> it should. It must be always integer, and you know, um, in fact, uh, in practice, a computer uh, selects uh, actually. Yeah, well, 
but this is this actually is not just to tell you that uh, anyway uh, computer may generate some um, objects which uh, un, which cannot be associated with chemical structures and uh, uh, we, we always use some uh, it means that we, we have some, something for the trash so it means that we need uh, to have and we, we also use this some sort of filtering um, filtering operation which uh, out of many many objects generated by machine i mean the text strings uh, selects as valuable chemical structures okay and anyway uh, uh, since you know the situation is a bit uh, uh, less complicated because what in reality uh, is um, predicted by a computer is a uh, label of chemical element simply it finds a probability that for example uh, nitrogen must be in this position with higher probability than carbon you know and uh, it calculates simply the probability for the uh, text string the probability for a given um, uh, element to follow another chemical element you know and this is not discrete or continuous it's just a question of the text and then this text is transformed into a chemical structure. This okay, is okay. Uh -huh, I understand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Grigory, please. Thank you very much. It's a, maybe a, will be a not traditional question for you because uh, all this time we, we call, call, uh, spoke today, we spoke about organic uh, molecules and organic synthesis. Uh, I am not organic and uh, I am uh, mainly work in the uh, solid state crystallographic chemistry and we have uh, different uh, similar discussions when we spoke about the crystal structures. Even yeah. the very big molecules like proteins very easily to predict and calculate. But when we spoke about this uh, inorganic chemistry molecule, especially uh, intermetallic compounds, it sometimes looks like a black box put a separate epoch, atoms shake it, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, receive unpredictable uh, structures with different uh, atomic distance, interatomic distances, and so on. Is it possible to uh, spoke about artificial intelligence to predict uh, structures not only for organics but also for inorganics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm, in principle, uh, I believe this is possible. Um, I would like just to cite the uh, works of Artem Oganov. Uh, nowadays he is in Moscow in Skoltech, but uh, in the past he was in New York. Um, his approach, which is called Uspek. Uh, which was uh, many times successfully used to predict uh, um, new inorganic structures, mostly inorganic structures, uh, as a function of pressure and temperature. And uh, he published several papers in Science and Nature um, predicting new inorganic uh, uh, crystals. And uh, um, I would advise you to look at his publication. So his, uh, it seems his uh, uh, program is uh, uh, publicly available. I, I, frankly, I don't know, no, it seems that yes, uh, but uh, just to, 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 to figure out. And uh, there are many, many successful applications. It's combination of quantum chemistry and chemical thermodynamics. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Raj. Do you have um, more questions, dear colleagues? Uh, dear Alexander, uh, you showed some examples of uh, searching uh, analogs of known reactions by artificial intelligence. But uh, what do you think about um, creation of new type of reaction, not analogs, the novel reaction? Is it possible or not? This is this is a point actually. <laughs> uh, you know there was the the I have a slide on, on this. Just wait wait a moment, please. Oh, my mouse doesn't work. Um, wait a moment, please. Um, no, this is not. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you know, um, what actually does uh, artificial intelligence nowadays? You know, it looks at the data and tries to find, it, what, it learns and, and tries to, to develop an analog. Very frankly, uh, we analyzed uh, some uh, very uh, strange and very interesting structures which uh, artificial intelligence uh, tries to generate. And in most of cases, it, con uh, it concerns some sort of errors of artificial intelligence. It's, it looks like a students who uh, didn't uh, learn pretty uh, well, you know, the textbook and uh, tries to, let's say, uh, uh, invent something really new, you know, some sort of fantasy. Uh, it also happens with artificial intelligence. But, you know, uh, tell me, how do people actually uh, invent new reactions? They actually um, use uh, the combination of the experimental, theoretical, and knowledge, etc. you know, that's amazing. intuition, which is some sort of uh, model in their brains. So to me, the only way uh, for artificial intelligence to become actually as creative as human being is to teach him, to, you know, it, to teach it uh, by fundamentals, theory of chemistry, physics, quantum mechanics, whatever, you know, biology, you know, uh, just to ask them to, to, to use not only available data, but also some fundamental knowledge of uh, in science in order to suggest new species. This is the way. For the moment, um, in sense of creativity, AI uh, is not able to compete with humans, but it can anyway, even now, to produce very, very interesting and unseen uh, and sometimes surprising results. You know, for example, just to tell you that what uh, people working in, in, in the pharma industry, they look for, they look for uh, um, the drug molecules, uh, which are eff effective, but uh, compared to analogs, which are analogs of existing drugs, but which ha have uh, different scaffolds. Scaffolds mean that uh, the, um, let's say, central part of molecule, uh, uh, which actually, uh, delineated by cyclic, uh, the part of molecule delineated by cyclic fragments. And uh, why? Because actually people, uh, the, com the companies patent scaffolds uh, instead of um, individual components. They, well, they, they patent, patent balls. But as soon as they, they use uh, another patent, they could overcome the patent. You know, uh, if they use another scaffold, they could overcome existing one. So, you know, and in this case, artificial intelligence can be pretty successful, you know, to generate analogs uh, possessing different uh, reasonable uh, scaffolds. So, I mean, for the moment, it is too early to discuss, uh, you know, uh, you know, that uh, to consider AI as the real competitors of human beings. But, you know, this is a extremely emergent field, extremely. Yeah. No, nobody can predict, you know, can anticipate what happens <coughs> in five, 10 years, you know? Yes, you are right. You know, this, this is just still uh, the very, very beginning of the story. Okay, and the uh, other question about supramolecular chemistry. So you showed examples of covalent uh, bond uh, cleavage or formation. What about supramolecular self-assembly, crystallization and so on? Yeah, you know, so a um, um, few days ago, we got uh, from ACS Central uh, Journal information that uh, our paper with Jean Madeleine um, has been accepted, you know. So what, what we we have done, we try to um, uh, develop an approach based on machine learning, etc. You know, helping to design new dynamic combinatorial libraries. Uh, you know, uh, this example shows that machine learning can successfully be used to. Uh, generate to suggest new supramolecular systems or well, not not really supramolecular in this case but this is a um, 
dynamic lag, but anyway, you know, the, the question, uh, general answer is positive. I'm pretty sure that it can be. What is an obstacle? The obstacle is existence of available experimental data. Please notice that chem informatics and artificial intelligence and machine learning build statistical models. Statistical models must be trained on uh, the training set, which are big enough. Okay, so people certain uh, people need to generate experimental data in order to build good models. By the fact that big pharma companies they do this, they generate data uh, aiming to produce good models, which could bring them new interesting structures. You know. This is uh, a very uh, nice concept, which is still uh, very little used in chemistry. Yeah. Thank you. Dear colleagues, do you have other questions? I don't see. Uh, let me thank again our lecture for a very interesting lecture for discussion. Uh, some philosophic <laughs> questions and for support of uh, our scientific community and for support of Ukraine in generally. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all for your kind attention. And uh, um, uh, look, uh, one day I hope to come uh, to, 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 to Kharkiv and to meet you personally. I hope uh this will be possible pretty uh you know pretty soon and i'm very optimistic uh concerning the development of the events in your your, your country i wish you i wish you uh the victory in your uh fighting thank you very much for your kind words very nice words yes very nice uh so dear colleagues today our seminar uh, is over. So in the future, maybe in one week, I'll announce the new seminar. I hope it will be seminar with Jean Marilyn. So goodbye. Bye bye. Bye.